Good morning, welcome back to class. Today we're going to talk about hazards and hazard assessments. So we're going to start with Unit 4, identifying hazards and their impacts. Our objectives are, we're going to talk about the three main hazards of, the three main classes of hazards. We're going to develop some hazards under each class as groups. And then we're going to evaluate the impacts of these hazards. First, we're going to start with the emergency planning process. So hazard analysis is where we start. This is going to be our roadmap of how we will work today. We start with the hazard analysis, identifying those hazards, and then from that we can develop our emergency operations plan, and then t- test and train on the plan, and then work on plan maintenance and review. So what are some types of hazards? The three main classes are human caused, natural, and technological. So natural hazards. There are natural hazards, natural disasters, severe weather, biological hazards. What what do you think are some natural hazards here in this area? Floods. Floods. Severe weather. Severe weather. Tornadoes. Tornadoes. Good. You know, others could be like earthquakes, landslides, etc. Then we have human cause hazards. This has to have some sort of human element. So the biggest one is something like terrorism or hazardous material spill, uh, violence, (coughs) excuse me, uh, hazards present in the community, but you know anything it has to have that human element in it to happen. And then technological hazards. This one is very similar to human cause but it has to have technology involved. So this is normally something like your cyber attack, phishing or hacking, could be a dam failure. What are some other technological hazards you can think of? Damage to the power grid, yeah. You know, the pow- power outage, a uh, component fails, knocks out power, that's, that's a great example. Yeah, if let's say a uh, component failed and the, now the floodgates come open and now flood the area, that would be a technological hazard, correct. Great job. All right, so now we're going to do a group activity. In your small groups, using your flip charts, you're going to go through and come up with at least uh, five natural hazards, three human caused, and three technological hazards. Put those on your flip charts, and then we'll talk about those in a few minutes. All right, welcome back. So now we've identified a number of hazards. The next step that we're going to do in groups is talk about direct and indirect impacts. So if you take, for instance, a power outage as, a, as your hazard, your direct impact would be you lose power. If you're a retail establishment, that means you lose all your computers, your registers, you can't check any people out, you can't run any reports. Indirect would be, <clears throat> so now we can't check people out, uh, we can't do payroll, we can't have people pay for items, and so it's a rolling effect. So now what I want you to do is take those hazards that you identified in the first group activity and list some direct and indirect impacts for each of those hazards. All right, great. So now we've identified our hazards. We've talked about direct and indirect impacts. Using that information, now we can start plugging that into our risk assessment tool. And that brings us also to the end of the unit review. So we talked about different hazard classes, natural disasters, human cause, and technological. Uh, We've also evaluated the impacts of those hazards with those direct and indirect impacts. And so in the next unit, when we come back from break, we're going to talk about hazard vulnerability assessment, plugging that information into a tool that will give us a quantitative uh, measure of what our hazards are so we can then develop our emergency operations plan. All right, welcome back. Hope you had a good break. Our next unit is... Unit 5, using a risk assessment process. We're going to show you a tool that you can use. It's an Excel tool. It's free to you uh, and available for you to use. 
but it'll walk you through the steps and give you an actual number of how to score your different hazards so you can decide what you need to focus on with your emergency planning process. In the unit objectives, first we're going to define what a risk assessment actually is and why we do it. By identifying those benefits, we're going to describe the risk assessment process and then we're going to show you the tool that you can use. Now this tool that we're going to use, you're not mandated to use it. It's not a FEMA requirement. It's not a federal or state requirement. It's just an example. If you have something better or something that you already use, you find something on the internet or by a computer program, you're more than welcome to use it. This is just an example to walk you through the process. So what is a risk assessment? It helps you identify the hazards that your campus faces and helps you assess the level of vulnerability to those hazards that we identified, natural, human cause, or technological. It also allows the campus to determine which of those could affect your campus, which areas of your campus are most vulnerable. For example, if you have laboratory, buildings, uh, clinical space, hazmat would be most vulnerable to those areas whereas in an academic space it wouldn't be as much because you don't have those hazardous materials there. Also, what assets will be affected and to what extent? So, just a quick discussion. How do you currently assess your campus for risk and vulnerabilities? Alice? Yeah, great. So, you, once a year you sit down and kind of talk about those in your group setting. Anybody else? All right, so now in our groups, we're going to take a few minutes, about 15 minutes, uh, 10 minutes in your group, to sit down and just write down on your flip charts every reason you can think of for conducting a risk assessment. All right, you guys came up with some great ideas, so we're going to go over a, a couple more of benefits of doing a risk assessment. One, it helps guide your management to decisions uh, to align resources for your emergency operations plan. You know, we don't have an endless pool of money. Nobody does, so we have to decide where can we best spend that money and get our best return on investment. One, uh, second, it helps create an emergency operations plan that assigns resources appropriately to, to meet the hazards. You, know, you don't want to send a whole bunch of bulldozers and other things to a chemical spill when you really need those for the flood or the building that just collapsed. It helps increase awareness among stakeholders. By getting a quantifiable number, you can make it more aware that a tornado you're more vulnerable to than you are a power outage. It allows administrators, staff, faculty, even students to practice what to do in an emergency. So if, you don't, if your folks don't know what to do in the event of a fire, by helping bring this to the forefront and defining your emergency plan, you can then train people and do an exercise or drill on that. It encourages sharing with outside stakeholders to coordinate your planning efforts. You can't live inside a vacuum. A campus setting is like a small city, but many of us don't have our own police, fire, or EMS departments, our own public health departments. So we need to pull in those outside stakeholders in the process and let them know as well what our hazards are and if they're the ones that are going to respond to those hazards how would they respond we need to build that into the plan as well it makes it easier to respond to emergencies because we've talked through what the hazards and vulnerabilities are we've talked about how we're going to respond to those so now we're better prepared to respond to those and it may also be required to obtain certain funding at the federal or state level if you want to receive hazard mitigation money to correct uh, something that's wrong or be better prepared for an emergency, you have to have a hazard mitigation plan. And part of that is doing a hazard vulnerability assessment. So how do we quantify the risk assessment? <clears throat> a lot of it's obvious. You know, we talked about what our different hazards are. We put those on our flip charts. Uh, we start talking about our campus areas that are vulnerable to the hazards. We need to talk about assets that can be affected, and we need to look at the degree to which those can be affected. However, you know, this is just a process of quantifying the hazard, risk, and vulnerabilities. So what are the steps? Step one, we have to identify the hazards, which we did.
So just a few that you guys mentioned. Tornadoes, thunderstorms. Hacking, flood. You know, those are just a few that we'll, we'll look at. <clears throat> so we identify those. We talk about our indirect and direct uh, impacts. That tells us more about the, the level that they affect us. It also has tertiary items that we start thinking about as well. You know, power outage is more than just a power outage. It can affect, you know, again, your computer systems, your lighting, which could call, uh, lead to an evacuation. It, uh, you lose your HVAC, heating and air conditioning. You can lose your food service because your kitchen goes down. So it's just a rolling effect that you need to talk about. Steps two and three. We need to determine probability. How likely is this event to affect us? If, for instance, a tornado and thunderstorms here in the Midwest, that's very likely. It's almost uh, a given that we're going to hit get multiple rounds of thunderstorms and tornadoes each year. Step three, you need to estimate your severity. We need to think about the people, your faculty, staff, students, visitors. How would a thunderstorm affect them if they're in an academic building versus if they're out at the football stadium? You know, two different levels. Facilities, we need to think about how the hazard will affect our building, our utilities, and our response. Uh, if we have a snow or ice storm, that's going to take a lot of resources to clear the campus in order to be open and be safe for everyone. Then we need to look at our institution. What is our level of bus business interruption? Will it, the hazard affect our reputation? You know, as we saw from Hurricane Katrina, Tulane and others weren't widely prepared for that level of a hurricane, and they actually had to shut down the university for over a year and shunt students to other universities. Step four, <clears throat> determine the relative risk of the hazards and rank them for your emergency planning process. So it takes the first steps and gives you an overall relative risk. And then you take step five into determining the level of preparedness or mitigation that you've completed in your planning process. If you've done things like written a plan, trained against the plan, mitigated the plan, then you should get credit for that. And overall, that should take your score down of your relative risk. As I said earlier, your risk assessment tool choices are varied. We're going to show you one free tool. It's an Excel spreadsheet. It's very easy to use. Again, it's free. But if you have something else that you already use or would like to use, that's perfectly fine. You got to select something that's most usable for your group that's most understandable for those folks doing the risk assessment. Because again, it's not in a vacuum, it's not just you. You should have a campus uh, group doing this as well as some external shareholders. And it has to be most useful to your planning efforts. So what are some examples? The DRCCC uh, risk and vulnerability assessment, you can Google that and find that in, on the internet. ICLEA, the Campus Law Enforcement Association, has a target vulnerability summary worksheet that you can use, talk to your campus law enforcement to gain access to that. And then again, the FEMA sample risk and vulnerability assessment. This one was developed by higher ed for, fire, for higher ed, so it, it really does a great job for our, our entities. Also, th this sample is on your course CD. Uh, it's both an Excel spreadsheet for the tool, and then there's a Word document that uh, is the guide that walks you through the whole process with all the questions, how the formulas are done, and then also talks about who should be on your planning team. So let's talk a few moments about our risk assessment team. Again, it should be a multifunctional cross-campus entity doing this, as well as external shareholders. So your most common ones are residential life, campus police, emergency management, environmental health and safety, uh, your facilities group, if you have a, a clinic on campus, your student health clinic. And then we need to also think about some of our external partners, such as the fire department, the police department, the Nat National Weather Service. Uh, that's one's real key for all your natural hazards. You're going to need data about how frequent are tornadoes or thunderstorms, what are wind speeds, what is the level of damage 
that you may expect from some of these uh, different natural hazards. Those folks already have the data, so use them to your advantage. Also, your campus risk manager or insurance representative, they'll have the data about injuries and illnesses based on some of these events that you'll need. So this is what the risk assessment worksheet looks like. <clears throat> we'll go more in depth uh, on it here in just a moment. But again, you identify what your hazards are and put them in the first column. You look at your probability. Then we look at the severity on people, buildings, and reputation. That will give us our overall relative risk. And then we'll add in the preparedness level to give us our final risk. So I'm going to show you the tool, and then we're going to break up in our groups here. All right. So here we have the tool. Uh, first, on the first tab is an incident list. So what we, went what we did is when we built the tool, we did a laundry list, racked our brains as much as possible to list all the natural events, technological events, and human-caused events, and put them down on this spreadsheet. So it's a great resource for you to go to. You can just choose and pick and move those over to the spreadsheet. Now, it's not exhaustive. There may be other things, such as like a sandstorm, if you live in the Southwest, that may not have been on here that you need to think about and add in on your own. But you go to the spreadsheet in column A, you, you list your hazards. So here's a few that we came up with in our groups. Then you go to your probability. So I talked about on your CD, there is a handbook, a guidebook, as a Word document that asks you the questions to answer some of these. Well, we've built them into the tool as well. If you hover over the column, it actually gives you the uh, question and answers. So for instance, probability. Consider the number of occurrences this hazard has occurred on your campus over the past 15 years, the number of similar events at other universities nearby, or any changes that could affect the frequency of this event on your campus. So you're going to estimate the likelihood of this event that will occur in the next 15 years. So for instance, a flash flood. Is it not applicable? It will not occur. Doubtful, not likely. Possible, probable, inevitable. You choose which number works uh, for that hazard, and you put it in there. So like for a flash flood, it could be a three. You know, it's possible that it could occur. Was well, a tornado more likely probable? Earthquake, you know, while it can be devastating, they don't happen very often. So maybe you know a two as doubtful. Then we look at our human impact. There's two questions here. The first, if this event has occurred in the past on your campus. What was the extent of your injuries? Did you have no injuries because the events never occurred on your campus? Were there few or minor injuries? Were there multiple injuries or a major injury? Four, multiple major injuries or a death? Five, multiple deaths and major injuries. So you just go through and assign that. Again, here's where your, your risk manager or insurance uh, person is going to be very helpful for that. So for instance, for a flash flood, Maybe you had multiple minor injuries, you know, some slip trips and falls from it, uh, some exposure to you know, some of the, the storm water. So that might be a three. Then we look at <clears throat> kind of looking forward. You know, maybe this hasn't happened. It hasn't happened very often. What is the potential for injuries or deaths from this? So again, it's very similar to the, the previous question, but you're kind of more forecasting using some common sense. So again, it's, uh, will there be no injuries from this event, few minor injuries, multiple minor injuries or possible death, multiple deaths or minor injuries, or multiple deaths and major injuries. So you put your value in there. Then we're going to look at the facilities impact. So we want to look at what is the vulnerability of your actual campus buildings and facilities to a tornado, to a flash flood. <clears throat> could be little or no damage, mild damage to several facilities, moderate damage to multiple facilities, severe damage to multiple facilities, or extensive damage to most facilities. 
So flash flood, you know, it might be moderate damage to multiple facilities. You know, some buildings are built on hill, they're raised up, they don't have a basement, so they'd be less likely to damage. Then we're going to look at the actual cost that this incident would cost you to not only respond to, but recover from. Now the nice thing about this is the tools unlocked. If you're a small community college, these numbers may be too large for you, so you may need to shrink the numbers to be more adaptable to your campus or buildings. If you're a medium institution, you, know, you can find middle ground here. These numbers here are for kind of a, a larger institution with a medical center. So it's consider the extent of damage to the central campus facilities, estimate the total cost to respond to the event and repair or replace the damaged facilities. So for instance, if a flash flood would cost you less than a million dollars, you'd choose number one. Between one million and $10 million, number two. 10 million to 100 million, 100 million to 1 billion, or more than 1 billion. Again, it's one to respond and repair, replace the actual facilities, but also your response costs. So if it's an ice storm, what would your snow removal cost? If you had to bring in food or uh, four-wheel drive vehicles that you had to rent to pick people up, you put all those numbers into this estimate. Next, we're going to look at institutional impact. So if this event were to occur on your campus, estimate the duration of interruption to your, your campus operations. So would it take hours? Would it impact you for days, weeks, months, years, or longer? So like something like a thunderstorm, if it rolls through, doesn't cause a lot of damage, that may only impact you for a few hours. Whereas a tornado, if you had some major damage, that could be months to uh, even years. Whereas an earthquake would definitely be years or longer to, uh, that may interrupt you. Then we want to look at how this is going to affect your reputation. So is the event not going to harm you at all? Is there going to be minor uh, impact that would negatively affect you? Moderate, significant, or severe? Now, if you're not prepared for the disaster, You've done no training, no planning. If you have people that perish because of the disaster, that's really going to affect your reputation. So you need to think about those things and put that in there. So as you see, I plug numbers in. I start getting my severity impacts and unmitigated risk. And then this next column is our level of preparedness. So again, if we've done something to prepare for it, training, written a plan, uh, done some mitigation, we should get credit for that, and overall that should take our score down. So we need to look at that. If we've done nothing, then that's a one. No plan or policy is developed. No training exercise have occurred. Two, poor. Plan policy is not developed. No training exercise have occurred. However, some resources have been Expended or identified to start the process. Fair. Plan policy is developed but needs to be updated or training exercises need to occur to test the plan or policy. Good. Plan or policy is developed <clears throat> but minor improvements are needed from our act or action report. Or fully prepared. Plan and policy is developed, written, and current. Training exercises are conducted on a routine basis to test the plan and policy and the plan and policy is shared with stakeholders. So we enter that in and that gives us a re overall relative risk. All right, so now we're gonna go in our groups and uh, we're gonna plug those into our tool. So again, the, the ones that you identified, human cause, technological, and natural, go ahead and for two of each of those, go ahead and plug in your estimated numbers for that. And then uh, we'll go ahead and plug some of those in the tool so you can see those final numbers and we'll go ahead and score those. All 
All right. Welcome back. So you've identified some of these and you've come up and put those up there. So we looked at tornado, earthquake, cyber attack, and flash flood just for some examples. We plugged the numbers in that you came up with. And as you can see, <clears throat> excuse me, on the chart, we went ahead and then ranked those on highest to lowest on the relative risk. So based on your numbers, we've identified at this time that tornado is our top risk, followed by earthquake, cyber attack, and flash flood. Now, what does that mean? If we look at the level of preparedness, for instance, tornado, we've, done, we've got a four, we've got most of our things in place, but we've got a little bit more work to do. So that might be something very easy that we can just do some additional training, update our plan, hold annual tornado drills, and we might be able to get that to a five, which then would reduce that relative risk. Now, if we come down to, for instance, flash flood, we're kind of in the middle of the road for, for preparedness, so maybe we have to do a lot of mitigation, such as better drainage, uh, raising up intakes for HVAC so that water can't flood there, putting in flood walls and such in our basements so that the mechanical rooms don't flood. Well, that's going to cost more money, so that might not be as easy to do. So from here, again, we can go to management and say, here's what we need to do, here's our plan of action, and it gives real hard numbers that management can look at to say, oh, I didn't realize that risk was that great to us. But again, from this, we can help build our plan and decide our course of action. All right, so what are some of the next steps? So we've categorized those, we've ranked those. From there now, we have our action plan going forward. <clears throat> From that, you know, again, we can then go to management and talk about, hey, here's what we need to fix, here's how much money it's going to cost, and by the way, here's the data to back that up. It also then will help you guide your emergency operations planning pro process. You know, you can't get everything done at once, so you can say, all right, here's our priority. We're going to focus on tornado, flash flood, and uh, earthquake first. You can write your plans to that effect and then move on to your, your lesser risk uh, to save time and to keep things going. That wraps up this unit. So again, in Unit 5, we talked about the risk assessment, why it's important, why we need to do it, how we do it. We showed you an example of a tool and talked about some other resources to uh, look at other tools. And we also walked through the process with that tool. Are there any questions? All right, thank you for your time. That, that ends these two units. We're going to go to break now for lunch, and we'll see you back this afternoon in one hour.